The revolution in Estonia was many things, born of decades of Soviet rule, and before that, Nazi occupation, and truly a centuries-old history of conquest. The revolution in the late 1980s was about claiming first and foremost their identity and their worth, their freedom from occupying choices, and more their liberation from oppression. It is, as we heard in the story, best understood in terms of their music. Their music, their songs were the fuel that drove them to revolution. But let me be clear, the revolution in Estonia was not fueled by a bunch of new songs. The revolution was fueled by hearing their old songs in a new way. For Estonia, Moisa Ma and their thousands of folk songs were part of their cultural imaginary. Now, as I understand it, the cultural imaginary or the social imaginary is a collection of stories and symbols and ideas that surround a people's concept of themselves and their particular identity. Cultural imaginaries aren't false, Rather, they inform, they are ideas that inform how a people understand their collective identity. This is a remarkably common practice. We see cultural imaginaries built in Latino communities, LGBTQ communities, immigrant and refugee communities, the symbols and stories and mythos of our people even music and literature and dances and food and media all come together to create this cultural imaginary or this imagined perfect identity. So we can see from our story about Estonia's singing revolution, setting the Koidula poem in an inspiring choral composition reminded the people of the things that made them Estonian. And the song became embedded as a symbol of their cultural imaginary which then helped them claim not just their cultural identity, but their very own liberation. We have our own cultural imaginary, built on the stories of John Murray and the shipwreck that led to the first Universalist sermon in America, the story of Henry David Thoreau and his two years in a cabin in Walden Pond, legends that tell us who we are, even if they're a little light on fact. In religious movements, the cultural imaginary is built on stories and sacred texts, rituals and practices and songs. For modern Unitarian Universalists, our cultural imaginary is grounded in a song which you all love, Spirit of Life, which interestingly took a little bit longer to become our song than the common understanding would suggest and more recently, Blue Boat Home, which is jokingly referred to as the Unitarian Freebird. <laughs> but it's important to our identity, these songs we sing. They tell us who we are and what we believe. It's said that people don't speak their theology as much as they sing their theology. And we sing ours. In these books collected 15 and 27 years ago. Now, here's the thing. If, as Unitarian theologian James Luther Adam asserts is right, revelation is not sealed, and there is always more for us to know and experience, then what does it mean that we're getting stuck in music that is decades old? Is our theology stuck in 2005 or 1993? Well, we know that's not true. Last year, the Commission on Institutional Change published their report, Widening the Circle of Concern, in which they call for a shift in our collective theologies to embrace liberation, namely, what does it mean to view how we are Unitarian Universalists and how we understand our principles and sources when we consider not just freedom from constraints and our fairly common reliance on self-reliance, 
but shift to considering those both in and outside our congregations and their collective liberation from poverty, bigotry, and oppression. When we change our view from how am I free from constraint to how are we liberated from oppression, we understand the power of Unitarian Universalism to be about the tide raising all boats, to help create a world where all of us are truly free to actually build the beloved community. When we shift our view, we understand the power of Unitarian Universalism to affirm that none of us are free until all of us are free. That is liberation. And while there are a couple dozen songs in our hymnals marked freedom and more marked none are marked liberation, but we know that art changes when we're not looking at it. And so when we look again at some of these songs, we see the liberation there just begging us to lean into it. We can look at a song like Circle Round for Freedom written by Cantor Linda Hirschhorn, and suddenly we see the collective liberation in it. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us in prison, circle for release. Circle for the planet, circle for each soul, for the children of our children, keep the circle whole. You hear it? Yeah. Even a song that uses I language like Oh Freedom, a folk song from the post-emancipation American South, these I songs suddenly aren't just about one person, but are about everyone praying for release from oppression. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my God and be free. It's there. And this isn't just about freedom songs. So many of our hymns speak to this call to liberation of all from, from the wealth of crush and power to wake now my senses, be thou my vision. All of these songs call us to liberation. Now, this isn't to say that every one of our hymns can or should be seen now through a liberative lens and, well, they're all fine now. We can just move on. Some of our hymns show us evidence of how the moral arc of the universe has been bending toward justice, even in the last 30 years. I first realized this when I took up a spiritual practice of singing our hymns, one a day, both books. Soon I was not only singing, but researching this, the hymns' origins, the histories, learning more about usage, their composers, and exploring the theologies. And over and over again, I bumped up on phrases like brothers and sisters and dark and light and words like stand and run and walk, and hymns that use themes about conquest and empire. And it's not surprising. Remember that the gray hymnal, Singing the Living Tradition, was first commissioned before the end of the Cold War and was only published in 1993. The members of the commission were told to approach this new hymnal expansively. For them, it meant theologies, more humanism, more of the new earth-centered traditions. And remember, we'd only gotten the sixth source and the seventh principle in the 80s. But it meant changing God language to be more inclusive and hymns and phrases to include women. And they were at the end of the Cold War, the end of apartheid, the end of nuclear proliferation, and we had just been at war in the Gulf. 
So what was on our minds and in the minds of our hymnal commission was peace and freedom. By the early 2000s, when the Teal Hymnal Singing the Journey was published, you'd think these things would have shifted, but again, we were at war again in the Gulf. So what was on our mind was peace and freedom. But since then, we have bent the moral arc toward justice a bit more, have drawn the circle of love a bit wider. We have learned about the gender spectrum, about the doctrine of discovery, about ableist language, critical race theory, intersectionality. And with it, we have learned the power of language to change the world and our minds and hearts and beliefs. And what this means is that there are in our hymnal some difficult songs with language that is difficult to sing in 2020. Art changes when we aren't looking at it, and sometimes it doesn't age well. For many, the hymn Will Build a Land is about the beloved community, echoing the quote from Martin Luther King Jr., who quoted the book of Amos in the Hebrew Scriptures. Come build a land where sisters and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace, where justice shall roll down like water, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. And then the Reverend Danielle DeBona, who is Native American, reminds us that, yes, you can sing it, but you have to think about me and how my people's lands were stolen in the name of God. So is it a song of justice and liberation? Can we sing it? Should we sing it? This is what this work of drawing the circle wide calls us to. It calls us to look at our assumptions, our language, our music, all of the elements of our Unitarian, Universalist cultural imaginary, and deciding what speaks the Unitarian, Universalist language we most need in order to truly love the hell out of this world. So what does all of this mean? Well, it's simply this. When we talk about widening the circle of concern in our world, our denomination, in our congregations, and in our personal lives, we do already have an amazing tool at our disposal. The songs that affirm not just peace and freedom, but songs that affirm liberation. Songs that proclaim a call to justice, equity, and compassion. Songs that inspire us to act Songs that comfort and feed our souls for the long journey ahead. And yes, there will be new songs, of course. We already have some of them already. We shall be known by the company we keep. And where you go, I will go, beloved. And the tide is rising, and so are we. But even in these two books, our living tradition, the tradition we hold close to our hearts, we have so much of what we need already to draw the circle wide. So let us sing and let us build a new way. <laughs>